don't want to spill it on my computer. And I know that's going to happen. So, uh, yes. How's everybody doing? Doing well? Excellent. Good. <clears throat> um, I'd like just to begin with uh, a few thank you. Um, I'd like to thank the organizers, the organizing committee of the conference for inviting me, the Land Academy and iOS uh, Fair Transitions. Um, thank you for your invitation and your hospitality and for the privilege uh, and pleasure of speaking uh, with you here today and attending the conference. Uh, special thanks to uh, Rick and Marit and Neil, whom I've met prior to uh, commencing today. And uh, thanks for all your uh, work and your hospitality. And we have visitors from uh, all over. We have visitors from many different continents. And I'd like to Sue, begin by acknowledging uh, your efforts to come a long way uh, so, and thank you for your attendance and for enriching our conversations. I hope the next few days are productive and stimulating, but most importantly, I hope they're happy for all of us. In the following talk, I'd like to do a few things. I'll address the aim of the conference, which is, quote, the joint challenge of finding ways to make transitions fair and inclusive for human and non-human life, by speaking to a few of the five guiding questions set out for us by the organizers. How could transitions be made fair for both human and non-human life? What role is there for land governance, actors, and formal and informal institutions? Who will have a seat at the table and what knowledges are taken into account? How will non-human interests be represented and could transitions be a lever for promoting equity? In addressing these questions, I'm going to set out three provocations for us to think with across the conference. These provocations are, the first, land is alive. The second, land transition is freedom work. The third is just transformation is pluriversal. I'll come to these three provocations in due course. I offer them as a means to pluralize epistemological, ontological, political, and ethical approaches to land, land governance, and land transitions. I come to the conference not as a transitions expert, nor as a land governance expert. In our conversation this morning, in our little circle, we had 16, 18 people, and um, there's wonderful expertise brought from students and scholars, uh, from community organizers, from NGO participants. So I'm very much uh, in your hands. So my comments here are, an outsider, if you like, looking in to see what happens in this conversation and what, any, if any, thoughts might be uh, useful from my own expertise and my own interests uh, for you. I've written uh, recently about the politics of global environmental governance. Specifically, I expressed a concern about the risks, as I see them, of global and earth governance rationales and decisions universalizing structures of power inherited from and which continue to reproduce colonial legacies. My critique provoked a defensive and robust response from some quarters, and we had a back and forth in the journal. If you're interested, you can read about it in the annals of the American Association of Geographers, which is one of our, the geographers' um, main journals. And if you can't access the papers due to the privatizations of knowledge, just ask me and I'll be happy to give them to you. With this slide, I pose similar questions to those that I raised for uh, in these in the papers on global environmental governance. So I pose similar questions here for land governance and fair transitions. These are questions you you are all exploring in the conference. Who sets the terms of what counts as inclusion? Inclusion and transition into what? 
And are the institutions and imaginaries within which diverse actors are being included fit for purpose? Or do dominant institutions and imaginaries reproduce many of the problems land justice and fairness seek to overcome? If they do reproduce forms of land injustice and unequal governance, then what imaginaries and institutions might be necessary for a politics of land? We're familiar with the problematic. If transition is across a threshold of power and into an institution, which is what transition means etymologically, a movement across a threshold into a pre-existing adaptive structure or form, if the invitation is into a nation state, an intergovernmental organization, or a framework for regulatory cooperation, like the UN or World Bank or EU framework or OECD or land state redistribution scheme or a corporate apparatus predicated on defensive sovereignty of property or extractivist economies of growth, then clearly the transition may be problematic. It may intend to be inclusive, but it may also not be sufficiently transformative for a precarious planet. Or it may set the conditions for what counts as inclusion without understanding fundamental differences across life ways and needs. Let's put it in terms of question three of the conference. Who will have a seat at the table? If there are more seats at the table, but the table itself is problematic, then transition isn't about environmental justice or about ecological thriving or about political accountability and responsibility. Concern about the politics of inclusion is mirrored in contemporary efforts by post-colonial settler states to incorporate indigenous worlds into their governance apparatuses. Consider the example of contemporary Canada where I am from originally. In Canada, recognition and reconciliation for past and present wrongs is normatively framed by dominant political institutions. Reconciliation is about recognizing a version of indigeneity that can be imagined and known by a state colonial framework. The institutional framework of the state, of the state seeks to reconcile past and present wrongs by transitioning indigeneity into a settler imaginary of Canada. The movement is across a threshold of a colonial apparatus, which leaves the state adaptive, but largely unchanged. But indigeneity and indigenous relationships to people and land are profoundly changed. Canada's colonial history requires reading contemporary approaches to reconciliation against the dispossession of native or indigenous people's lives and land. Settler colonial myths and tropes about land in Canada have been long predicated on terra nullius, the, triumphant, the triumph of nationhood over forbidding wilderness and capitalist development or improvement. These rationales govern the continued violence of dispossession. As we know, however, such stories displace indigenous relationships with land and place. In the context of reconciliation, Operative normative frameworks preclude the, transform the transformation of national settler imaginaries. In his influential book, Red Skin, White Masks, the yellow, leg, yellow knives DNA scholar Glenn Coulthard puts it this way Canada's legal and political understanding of reconciliation renders Indigenous assertions of nationhood consistent with the state's unilateral assertion of sovereignty over native people's lands. In other words, the terms of what counts as reconciliation, in our context, perhaps transition into inclusive governance, are defined by the colonial state. Dispossession of land remains the goal of settler colonialism. Land, however, is at the center of indigenous place-based practices. Coulthard and numerous other indigenous scholars whose work has come enormously to the fore in contemporary scholarship argues that indigenous struggles are struggles not only for land, but also deeply informed by what the land as a mode of reciprocal relationship, which is itself informed by place-based practices and associated forms of knowledge, 
ought to teach us about living our lives in relation to one another and our surroundings in a respectful, non-dominating and non-exploitative way. Coulthard terms this ethical framework provided by place-based land practices and associated forms of knowledge, grounded normativity, ways of being and acting literally well up from the land relations. The land itself is the legal guide. Mary Graham, a Kombu Mary scholar from Australia, puts it simpler still, the land is the law. Hers is what we in the Western philosophical tradition would call an ontological claim. Land itself is the guide. Frameworks for governing are not applied to land. The framework is the land, and we inhabitants within land look to land for our normative ground. In contrast to Western concepts of land, land from an indigenous perspective is not merely a resource available for human use. In preparing for the conference, I read up on how some land use transitions literatures define land. A recent 2021 review by Long et al. from over 20 years of land use transition research from 1987 to 2020 which analyzed 8,564 records, defines land as follows. Land is the spatial carrier of anthropogenic activities, the most basic production factor of socioeconomic development, and the most fundamental survival resource for urban and rural re residents. Compare this to the characterization of land for indigenous peoples as articulated by Coulthard. Land occupies an ontological framework for understanding relationships. Or consider Cree scholar and geographer Michelle Digg's characterization of land. Land is an animate being, a relative, a food provider, and a teacher of law and governance to whom we are accountable. Both Coulthard and Degla draw on and echo the famous Sioux scholar Vine Deloria Jr., who argued that Western philosophical conceptions of meaning and value differed in a fundamental respect. Indigenous worldviews, Deloria argued, hold their lands places as having the highest possible meaning, and all their statements are made with this reference point in mind. Most Western societies, by contrast, he argued, tend to derive meaning from the world in historical or developmental terms, thereby placing time as the narrative of central importance. Such philosophical differences become crucial when negotiating frameworks and processes for governance between indigenous and the non-indigenous worlds. There's a terrain of incommensurability to the epistemic and ontological terms of discussion. In other words, we can't make the world the same. We can't make them comparable because they're fundamentally incomparable. The worlds, their imaginaries and institutions cannot be made the same. Let's illustrate this by returning to the metaphor of the table for a moment. Recall one of our conference questions, who will have a seat at the table and what knowledges are taken into account? The question I've thus far posed in the context of transition as reconciliation is, what if the table itself is problematic? Inclusion around a faulty table is still a faulty table. Indeed, why do we assume that a table is an apt model for negotiating questions of transition and governance? It certainly is the dominant model for how we in the global north think about negotiation and discussion regarding governance and transitions of energy, land, climate, and the like. But there are other models. Consider the palaver. <clears throat> Palavers are a key socio-political institution in pre-colonial and contemporary post-colonial Africa. Palavers are an assembly where issues are freely debated and important decisions concerning communities are taken. The purpose of the palaver is to resolve latent and overt conflicts in certain highly specific situations. Participants usually gather under a palaver tree where everyone has the right to speak and air their grievances or those of their group. Palaver in English today has a pejorative meaning that's come out of this uh, original meaning. 
The English word palaver refers to an unnecessarily drawn out trouble or bother, something involving much tedium talk or negotiation. The contemporary word palaver derives from the West African Portuguese pidgin palavra, which referred to making palaver, a dialogue or a conference between tribespeople and traders. In West African English, it colloquially refers to a dispute or a quarrel that requires arbitration. The arbitra arbitration happens in palaver courts, palaver houses, palaver rooms, or under palaver trees. Palavers are institutions which are or have been practiced in multiple sub-Saharan West and Central African countries. Anna Fleur Kashida writes of palavers, they are spaces for open communication by which persons are integrated into the life and expectations of their communities. This space can be physical, as when community members gather under the ancestral tree, but more importantly, it's the psychological and social space for open communication. Masamba Ma'umpolo calls it speech that liberates. Within the palaver, discourse was thus raised into a system of jurisdiction and government. The palaver is a practice that supports a community's well-being, even through difficult times, making it an excellent resource for pursuing successful post-conflict resolution and reconciliation. I contrast palavers to tables to make a point about institutional imaginaries for governance and decision-making. I make it also to foreground the relational context within which dialogue and discussion about governance is made. The relational space of the palaver is a praxis, as Fleur Kashid notes, that grounds itself often quite literally in the living relations of the land. A tree is often at the center of the place building work of the palaver. The tree too is a participant in the discussion. It may be an ancestral tree, one that's been there for a long time, but also, and this is crucial, it may be kin, a literal ancestor. The tree is also a gathering agency of shade, comfort, support, and sustained spatial presence a dynamic of space as well as time, within which people gather as a part of the grounding relations from which norms are learned, debated, and decided. If we shift the transition governance imaginary to the institution of the palaver and ask the question, who will gather at the palaver and what knowledges are taken into account, I guarantee you we'll have a different answer or set of answers than if we invoke the imaginary of the table at a table. If we actually go and sit under a tree and speak possibly for days in Yoruba, Akan, or Bula, and listen and everyone present gets the chance to speak, what imaginaries and frameworks might emerge? The outcomes may not be necessarily better or worse, but they'll be different because they will have been shaped by how cool card Remember, frame land as an ontological framework for understanding relationships. Which brings me to my first provocation, <clears throat> land is alive. It's not particularly provocative. Of course it's alive. Soil, trees, animals, insects, air, oceans, all living are filled with life. But what if, unlike how we often approach land in dominant Northern political narratives, wherein land is an abstraction made of separate living parts. What if we approach land as a living whole, much like as a beehive is a superorganism? Like the beehive, the organism of land is not a community of individual parts, but an interacting and intradependent whole of which humans are simply a part. How many of us, particularly in debates in the global north about land governance or transition narratives, foreground this presumption and principle, this imaginary, for when asking about where to begin with the politics of land? Do we begin with the characterization provided by Degla that land is an animate being, a relative, a food provider, and a teacher of law and governance to whom we're accountable? Do we begin with the premise that land is, as many indigenous people and scholars argue, kin? What would happen if we began an approach to land governance with kinship as the organizing principle? 
Various indigenous and non-indigenous scholars have recently asked this question. The approach to the non-human or more than human as kin comes partly in response to the enormous shift in recent decades within the social sciences and humanities to what is sometimes called post-humanism, sometimes materiality studies, or broadly the ontological term. That is, the term to the ways by which human and non-human sociality is a product of relational agencies, the forces of human and non-human action and interaction that make up complex assemblages of social life. Post-human and ontological terms have over the past 30 or so years begun to question, move quite far along, questioning humanists or anthropocentric understandings of what humans are. They question humanist metanarratives, the idea that humans share a universal nature or a species identity, an essential humanity, that we are exceptional and radically different from other animals. On the one hand, and from machines on the other. And that humans are ultimately free subjects who can determine their own history above the rest of nature. This enormous explanatory and analytic shift in critical scholarship seeks to decenter liberal humanist narratives. The reasons for the shift are many. They're primarily about challenging human exceptionalism, but they're also about challenging the individualist notion of rational agency, the nature culture binary that sits at the heart of modern humanist exceptionalism, the Eurocentric production of liberal humanism, and crucially, the continued ways by which liberal narratives of reason and freedom are themselves built from modern practices of racist and colonialist exclusion. Liberal humanism, after all, depends on these colonialist exceptionalisms that raise certain kinds of human to those counted as rational or democratic. We need to recognize that such narratives and rationales would sit for better or worse at the heart of liberal democratic governance transitions are the same governance transitions and frameworks that underpin dominant modern political discussions of land. In contrast, Relational approaches argue instead for how, in the words of the famous Jamaican scholar Sylvia Winter, the human is meta Darwinianly a hybrid being, both bios and logos, or as I've come to recently define it, bios and mythos. As Franz Fanon says, phylogeny, ontogeny, and sociogeny together define what it is to be human. Post-human and ontological accounts, which challenge the falsity and negative effects of the nature culture binary, posit instead what's called a relational ontology, a schematic of which you can now see on the screen. Let's consider how each of these models produce different imaginaries of land. On the left, you can see a Euro-modern ontological schematic that begins in a separation of nature and culture. This is the model that dominates contemporary political approaches to environmental governance because, in part, it dominates contemporary institutional politics. On the right is a relational schematic wherein no grounding separation exists between nature and culture. Instead, a flat ontology does not begin by accepting the human. Land on the left is the thing separate from human reason. On the right, land would be the relation out of which humans emerge as one feature among many. On the left, land would be subject to politics or culture. On the right, things like songs and tools and stories are forces that define on an equal footing with rocks and plants and wind, how humans become self-conscious. On the left, the question of politics is contained within a debate between culture A, culture B, and culture C, as to which approach is best universally applied to nature or land. We see this all the time in shifts in political cultures, in different political dynamics, and how that's going to affect um, 
landed on this decision. On the left, culture is used to exclude certain people and ideas as closer to nature and therefore baser. On the, right, on the right, rationales emergent from the plural relationships are used to explain hierarchies of meaning and value. What you need to imagine in this diagram is that on the right, the, interac in the interactions are dynamic and moving in their complexity. So they're not fixed networks, but they're constantly dynamic and moving. On the left, nature and culture are also dynamic, but the modern worldview begins with their conceptual separation as their starting point. Contemporary posthumanist and ontological accounts that cite as their touchstones Western European philosophical traditions and theories, theorists like Bruno Latour and Gilles Deleuze and Donna Haraway and others, do not typically, although Haraway might be an exception, posit relational worlds as kin. They may recognize that the tree at the center of the palaver enacts what emerges as political, but they don't normally go as far as claiming the tree to be a literal ancestor or a member of the family. Recent indigenous scholarships have come forward to critique the ways relational ontology is derived in Western frameworks, often reproduce colonial logics simply by their exclusion of indigenous ways of knowing. Indigenous scholarships argue that indigenous peoples have always begun in and with relationality, as that as what the West would call its ontological and political starting points. Why not, they ask, begin with indigenous worlds instead of Western ontological accounts? So to return to our palaver tree is the space for addressing how to make transitions fair and inclusive. Let's look at the problem through the question for the conference. How will non-human interests be represented? Who and what are now sitting around the tree and how can they be heard? Perhaps if we begin by translating a somehow separate domain of land or nature more broadly into the terms of culture, we do a certain practical or conceptual violence to the non-human life. Nature or land is universalized in this model as an other to culture, and culture similarly be limited as an other to nature. But what if we begin in the specificities by which particular place relations constitute meaning, with particular relationships, and crucially with knowledge systems and people expert in these places? Then non-human interests are not represented as something separate from human understanding. They become rather co-emergent with the relationships of land and its meanings um, themselves. If we begin with the assumption that non-human interests are somehow separate from human interests, as though human interests are exceptional to the interests of plants or jaguars, then representing them is a problem. But if we begin in the complexity of a relational place, where interests are co-emergent dynamics of becoming together, then representing interests is not about understanding separate beings, as though their interests are distinct from one another, but about the relations that make up flourishing of the place, the land, that just make up the politics of driving. So here I come to my second provocation. Land transition is freedom work. How do we do this relational politics? So far, I've argued drawing on the work of post-human and indigenous scholarship that relational approaches to land understand land itself as the source of politics and the guide of governance. The work of living well, which after all is what the work of politics is all about, derives from cultivating an attention to the constitutive relationships that encourage thriving. Relationships that in the words of abolition, geographer Ruth Wilson Gilmore, make life precious. As Wilson Gilmore often says, where life is precious, life is precious. Our political responsibilities, she argues, are to care for and to build sustaining worlds that literally make us. What relational approaches advocate is a politics of connection 
to living relations rather than, if you will, a freedom from connection and responsibility or an attempt to prioritize political principle or political practice. The political work of freedom, equity, equity, sustainability, and sovereignty for Wilson Gilmore, as it is also for indigenous approaches, is to build place-based relationships from grounded normative practices. Place for Gilmore is more than a locality. It entails the entire ensemble of people and the bonds among them. Consider again the relationality of the palaver as a governance place to build such ecologies rather than the perhaps more conceptual and removed table as a metaphor for guiding approaches to institutionalized governance. Political responsibility to the physical building of place relationships from the tree in the center is predicated on care and thriving. For the tree's relationship is grounded in that particular land is place and across ancestral time. Ruth Wilson Gilmore phrases this positive place building work in her dictum, freedom is a place. For freedom is not the remove for her, freedom is not the liberation from constraint, but the responsibility to carrying constraint. Wilson Gilmore has long been known as one of the chief advocates of prison abolition in the United States, but also elsewhere. Abolition, however, while it is about the removal of carceral geographies like prisons, jails, and surveillance, and about opposing economies of abandonment, fosters abolition through world building. Abolition geography challenges the general notion that territory is alienable and exclusive. It demands that we attend to reciprocal relationships between people and land. It's an abundance politics that emerges from specific relations that build a politics from specific place building. Recently within geography, the concept of abolition ecology, which evolved from Gilmore's work, has theorized the ensemble of human and more than human relations. Hayden and Ibarra write about recognizing the deeper racialized ways that nature has always been unevenly socially produced through relations with empire, settler colonialism, and racial capitalism. Abolition ecology entails understanding the ways that reciprocal land relations are often synonymous with liberation struggles, and as such about building intuitions and processes that are explicitly focused on the political, ecological imperative of access to fresh air, clean water, sufficient land, amelioration of toxic chemicals, and beyond. Thus, the effort is to counter racialized and plantation logics that can be reproduced in dominant institutionalized approaches to governance and transition. We might read the flowering of Black land and agroecological collectives in North America as examples of these place world forms of grounded normative practice in the effort of liberation. What is interesting about these forms of land transition that oppose the segregation of land from Black and racialized people is that while joined up, they're very much a politics of land from below, from actually gardening and actually growing food. These are examples of on the land or on the ground change rather than institutional change where people are turning to real forms of practical change. Similarly, Land Back is an indigenous led decentralized and ground up movement across North America that seeks sovereignty and indigenous governance and returning people to land relations and for finding their place in systems of life. As Beverly Jacobs, an indigenous law professor at the University of Windsor explains, indigenous laws are always about responsibilities from and to land, its constitutive relationships and reciprocities. Both land back and black led agroecological initiatives are examples of urban and rural land-based place worlds where bottom up freedom work constitutes the normative political grounds for governance and transition. So this is an example, we might take one that we mentioned briefly in the session this morning, The Land in Our Names, Lion, which is a UK-based organization 
seeking to challenge the inequities of land tenure in the UK, where 50% of the land in the UK is owned by 1% of the population, and 99% of the land is farmed by rural land, that is farmed, is farmed by white farmers. And they're seeking to use this organization as a means to address reparation and reparation responsibilities through growing food. And so beginning in a different kind of place, then through the institutional apparatuses of a kind of uh, policy shift or policy shift. So I come to my third provocation to finish. Just transition requires pluriversal transformation. If we begin, as I've been arguing, with specific grounded place-based land relations and their human ensembles, as practical and political geographies for theorizing situated land governance and just land transitions, then we're faced with a political challenge. Place worlds do not seek to rationalize a universal approach to adjudicating just transition. They emerge from specific ensembles of situated relations. All are focused on building, flourishing, and thriving where life is precious, life is precious and freedom is a place. They're not concerned with top-down institutionalized frameworks for land policy. What we're faced with instead is a plurality of place worlds, a world of many worlds. In the terms of decoloniality, we're faced with the pluriverse. Pluriversality is a concept that's been around for some time in decolonial scholarship. Pluriversality renounces the conviction that the world must be conceived as a unified totality in order for it to make sense. Pluriversality views the world instead as an interconnected diversity, a world in which many worlds coexist. It's a cornerstone notion in decolonial analysis. Differences, as I've suggested already, are not simply a function of cultural perspectives on one world that lies outside us, but are constitutive enactments of multiple material worlds that human and non-human entanglements make and perform. The pluriversal argument is not abstract or esoteric. It's a practical one that contests the reductive extractivist logic of contemporary colonial territorialization. Its ontological emphasis resists what John Law terms the one world world a world that privileges itself as the arbiter of explanation and reproduction, and which rendering itself legitimate precludes the possibility of other horizons and ways of life. The analytic option here emphasizes ontological plurality of land so as to recognize the many different enactments and sets of relations that constitute possibilities of life. As John Law writes, <clears throat> If we live in a single container world within a universe in which nature has a definite and natural form, then we might imagine a liberal way of handling the power saturated encounters between different kinds of people and in our interpretations of the world. But if we live instead in a multiple world of different enactments, if we participate in a pluriverse, then there will be, there can be no overarching logic or liberal institutions, diplomatic or otherwise, to mediate between the different realities. There is no overarching. Instead, there are contingent, more or less local and practical engagements. And that's it. The ground of politics and action comes not from a removed ability to adjudicate or discriminate frameworks but from the actual relations that constitute possibilities of livelihood, love, care, flourishing, thriving, etc. The ground for just or fair relations is then a politics of so-called, is not then, sorry, is not then a politics of separation and decision, but the actual situated positions of living, breathing, eating, loving, disputing that come from earthbound, from landed ecologies of care. Fostering transformative relations of care is the political responsibility of land governance and just transition. 
And so I'll end maybe with a fourth provocation that came to me a few just this morning, where I was like always thinking about transitions. Is the language of transition sufficient to meet the demands of a contemporary land politics? Or do we need something that's just a bit more transformative? Is there a difference between the transition when you shift the transition into institutions? Or do we need something much more radical than the language that transition can, um, can provide? And perhaps transformation is a different way of conceptualizing or imagining uh, political responsibility. So I'll end there. Thank you very much for your attention and a sweaty final afternoon. I think there is.